Paper 160, Rodin of Alexandria. On Sunday morning, September 18, Andrew announced that no work would be planned for the coming week. All of the apostles except Nathaniel and Thomas went home to visit their families or to sojourn with friends. This week Jesus enjoyed a period of almost complete rest, but Nathaniel and Thomas were very busy with their discussions with a certain Greek philosopher from Alexandria named Rodin. This Greek had recently become a disciple of Jesus through the teaching of one of Abner's associates who had conducted a mission at Alexandria. Rodin was now earnestly engaged in the task of harmonizing his philosophy of life with Jesus' new religious teachings, and he had come to Magadan hoping that the Master would talk these problems over with him. He also desired to secure a first-hand and authoritative version of the Gospel from either Jesus or one of his apostles. Though the Master declined to enter into such a conference with Rodin, he did receive him graciously, and immediately directed that Nathaniel and Thomas should listen to all he had to say and tell him about the Gospel in return. 1. Rodin's Greek Philosophy Early Monday morning, Rodin began a series of ten addresses to Nathaniel, Thomas, and a group of some two dozen believers who chanced to be at Magadan. These talks, condensed, combined, and restated in modern phraseology, present the following thoughts for consideration. Human life consists in three great drives, urges, desires, and lures. Strong character, commanding personality, is only acquired by converting the natural urge of life into the social art of living, by transforming present desires into those higher longings which are capable of lasting attainment, while the commonplace lure of existence must be transferred from one's conventional and established ideas to the higher realms of unexplored ideas and undiscovered ideals. The more complex civilization becomes, the more difficult will become the art of living. The more rapid the changes in social usage, the more complicated will become the task of character development. Every ten generations mankind must learn anew the art of living if progress is to continue and if man becomes so ingenious that he more rapidly adds to the complexities of society, the art of living will need to be remastered in less time, perhaps every single generation. If the evolution of the art of living fails to keep pace with the techniques of existence, humanity will quickly revert to the simple urge of living, the attainment of the satisfaction of present desires. Thus will humanity remain immature, society will fail in growing up to full maturity. Social maturity is equivalent to the degree to which man is willing to surrender the gratification of mere transient and present desires for the entertainment of those superior longings, the striving for whose attainment affords the more abundant satisfactions of progressive advancement toward permanent goals. But the true badge of social maturity is the willingness of a people to surrender the right to live peaceably and contentedly under the ease-promoting standards of the lore of established beliefs and conventional ideas, for the disquieting and energy-requiring lore of the pursuit of the unexplored possibilities of the attainment of undiscovered goals of idealistic spiritual realities. Animals respond nobly to the urge of life, but only man can attain the art of living albeit the majority of mankind only experience the animal urge to live. Animals know only this blind and instinctive urge. Man is capable of transcending this urge to natural function. Man may elect to live upon the high plane of intelligent art, even that of celestial joy and spiritual ecstasy. Animals make no inquiry into the purposes of life. Therefore they never worry, neither do they commit suicide. Suicide among men testifies that such beings have emerged from the purely animal stage of existence, and to the further fact that the exploratory efforts of such human beings have failed to attain the artistic levels of mortal experience. Animals know not the meaning of life. Man not only possesses capacity for the recognition of values and the comprehension of meanings, but he also is conscious of the meaning of meanings. He is self-conscious of insight. When men dare to forsake a life of natural craving for one of adventurous art and uncertain logic, they must expect to suffer the consequent hazards of emotional casualties, conflicts, unhappiness, and uncertainties, at least until the time of their attainment of some degree of intellectual and emotional maturity. Discouragement, worry, and indolence are positive evidence of moral immaturity. Human society is confronted with two problems, attainment of the maturity of the individual and attainment of the maturity of the race.
the mature human being soon begins to look upon all other mortals with feelings of tenderness and with emotions of tolerance. Mature men view immature folks with the love and consideration that parents bear their children. Successful living is nothing more or less than the art of the mastery of dependable techniques for solving common problems. The first step in the solution of any problem is to locate the difficulty, to isolate the problem, and frankly to recognize its nature and gravity. The great mistake is that, when life problems excite our profound fears, we refuse to recognize them. Likewise, when the acknowledgment of our difficulties entails the reduction of our long-cherished conceit, the admission of envy, or the abandonment of deep-seated prejudices, the average person prefers to cling to the old illusions of safety and to the long-cherished false feelings of security. Only a brave person is willing honestly to admit and fearlessly to face what a sincere and logical mind discovers. The wise and effective solution of any problem demands that the mind shall be free from bias, passion, and all other purely personal prejudices which might interfere with the disinterested survey of the actual factors that go to make up the problem presenting itself for solution. The solution of life problems requires courage and sincerity. Only honest and brave individuals are able to follow valiantly through the perplexing and confusing maze of living to where the logic of a fearless mind may lead and this emancipation of the mind and soul can never be effected without the driving power of an intelligent enthusiasm which borders on religious zeal. It requires the lure of a great ideal to drive man on in the pursuit of a goal which is beset with difficult material problems and manifold intellectual hazards. Even though you are effectively armed to meet the difficult situations of life, you can hardly expect success unless you are equipped with that wisdom of mind and charm of personality which enable you to win the hearty support and cooperation of your fellows. You cannot hope for a large measure of success in either secular or religious work unless you can learn how to persuade your fellows to prevail with men. You simply must have tact and tolerance. But the greatest of all methods of problem-solving I have learned from Jesus, your Master. I refer to that which he so consistently practices, and which he has so faithfully taught you, the isolation of worshipful meditation. In this habit of Jesus' going off so frequently by himself to commune with the Father in heaven is to be found the technique not only of gathering strength and wisdom for the ordinary conflicts of living, but also of appropriating the energy for the solution of the higher problems of a moral and spiritual nature. But even correct methods of solving problems will not compensate for inherent defects of personality or atone for the absence of the hunger and thirst for true righteousness. I am deeply impressed with the custom of Jesus in going apart by himself to engage in these seasons of solitary survey of the problems of living, to seek for new stores of wisdom and energy for meeting the manifold demands of social service, to quicken and deepen the supreme purpose of living by actually subjecting the total personality to the consciousness of contacting with divinity, to grasp for possession of new and better methods of adjusting oneself to the ever-changing situations of living existence, to effect those vital reconstructions and readjustments of one's personal attitudes which are so essential to enhanced insight into everything worthwhile and real, and to do all of this with an eye single to the glory of God to breathe in sincerity your master's favorite prayer, not my will, but yours be done. This worshipful practice of your master brings that relaxation which renews the mind, that illumination which inspires the soul, that courage which enables one bravely to face one's problems, that self-understanding which obliterates debilitating fear, and that consciousness of union with divinity which equips man with the assurance that enables him to dare to be godlike. The relaxation of worship, or spiritual communion as practiced by the Master, relieves tension, removes conflicts, and mightily augments the total resources of the personality. And all this philosophy, plus the gospel of the kingdom, constitutes the new religion as I understand it. Prejudice blinds the soul to the recognition of truth, and prejudice can be removed only by the sincere devotion of the soul to the adoration of a cause that is all-embracing and all-inclusive of one's fellow men. Prejudice is inseparably linked to selfishness. 
Prejudice can be eliminated only by the abandonment of self-seeking and by substituting therefore the quest of the satisfaction of the service of a cause that is not only greater than self, but one that is even greater than all human.